with Mr. Patel and today's talk um, I have some questions for you about inversions, the category of poses uh, we know as inversions. Um, so one big debate is, is downward dog, back to downward dog, is downward dog an inversion? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> what is the question? Is it an inversion? Should it be on the inversion <clears throat> list? It's not a complete inversion, but it is an inversion. So you get some of the benefits that you... Of inversion, as yeah. well as you get the benefit of, <clears throat> of a forward bend. The other thing that should be known is that there are variations that people do in Shirshasana. One of the variations is to bring the leg down. Mm -hmm. okay? That's kind of a little downward dog. Or a one-legged downward dog, yeah. So, Inversions are considered something where the head is below the trunk. So that's the definition of an inversion for you. I have never been given that definition, but that's what I have assumed. So then Uttanasana would also be an inversion. Definitely. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Good to know. Um, well, I thought we would start um, a little bit with, um, I went through my light on yoga because I know there's a long um, description of benefits for particularly Shirshasana and Sarvangasana. Um, but I noticed that Mr. Iyengar doesn't say very much about um, Aramukha Vrikshasana and Pinchamayarasana. And I was wondering, maybe we could start with those because he didn't have much to say. I was wondering if you have much to say. I think if Mr. Angar had said everything he knows about every posture, the book would not be accommodated in this room. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, because he didn't give us much information on those two poses, maybe let's start with handstand. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the benefits are physically, energetically for handstand? See, a posture that's an inversion, but most people cannot hold it for very long. To get that posture to become from physical to physiological is possible. But to go to organic level or pranic level or sensory level, generally not possible. One fanatic may be able to do it, but almost everybody cannot. So that's why emphasis is given much more that you do arm balance to get your arms strong enough, uh, get some flexibility in that direction. How would you then take that ability to Shishasan? Okay. In Shishasan, so you don't have to be told every so often, lift your shoulder, lift your shoulder, lift your shoulder. When the arms are strong enough, you will create that lift. The biggest complaint in Shishasana is my neck hurts. That complaint will go away completely. So you're looking at handstand more as a path to uh, a to, pose that you can hold longer. Yes. But I would have to say in my own experience, handstand creates a lot of joy. There's, there's that. I would call that a good thing, but a bonus. <laughs> okay, not, not the goal, just a side yeah. bonus. And, and I would take that same thing that I said. Can you take that joy, full sensation, to Shishasana, then arm balance has taught you something. Okay, so then, um, so handstand, would you say, is the most accessible of the inversions if we're looking at handstand, forearm balance, headstand? Most accessible, yeah. yes. So then the next, <clears throat> the next pose in that would be Pinchamayarasana, forearm balance. So can you talk about the difference between handstand and forearm balance? In handstand, you are on your hand. Obvious difference. Yes. Okay. Forearm balance, you are on your upper arms. Okay. What changes between those two? In handstand, your hands can be apart. Elbows can even be a little closer to each other, which gives an access to a much deeper aspect of your of your uh, of the muscles near the near the vertebral column. Elbow balance or forearm balance doesn't do that. Hands are together, elbows are apart. Immediately what that does is it rotates the arms internally. Well, we've got this one and then Mr. Anger shows this one. Both? Yeah. 
But even in this one, if you notice, most people are given a block between the hands right. and a belt around right. for the same reason. Right. That if nothing is given, tendency is to do this. Right. And like I often say in the class, what the body can automatically do is generally wrong. That's so frustrating. I don't know <laughs> whose idea that was, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very true and always annoying. <laughs> So, okay, so the, you're saying the basic difference is that you're internally rotating the forearms and then that makes it more challenging. Yes. <clears throat> How does that prepare you better for Shirshasana? Because Shirshasana, you're automatically internally rotating the arms, except in Nirlambha Shirshasana. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, what people do is, in Shirshasana, they are in this position. When they go to Nirlambha Shirshasana, they very often forget the primary reason they think is to balance on the neck. It's not. It's to see that you can keep your hands away from each other, elbows towards each other, which in Shishasana you cannot do. Which again gives a very different access to widening the shoulder blades away and working near the vertebral column. Okay, that's um, a physical response, physical, addressing the physical. Um, can you say anything about energetically when we move from forearm balance to head steel? The kind of <clears throat> effect I told you about near the vertebral column, that builds up a basis from where organic work can happen. If this area is collapsing, even though if I think I'm lifting, but I'm not quite really, because there is no wide space there, then that, that work doesn't happen, organic work, and certainly not pranic work. Because I might feel the breath in the belly, but I don't feel any movement of the breath up here. Mm -hmm. When the fact is the breath moves from the chest, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that becomes accessible. So one of the big differences between handstand and forearm balance is you're in a bit, bit more of a backbend in, in forearm balance. And I, am I correct in, in to translation that uh, Pinchamarasana is peacock feather? Is that the correct translation? That, that's the correct translation, yeah. <clears throat> and is it named such because of the bend in, in the feather? No. No, tell me. It's a poetical expression. Okay. <clears throat> We get into a lot of trouble over this. Something that is given as a poetical expression cannot be literally translated and certainly not into another language. Look at peacock feather. If you see it, yes, it's curved. But if you look at it sort of with artistic eye even, you see that it's not collapsing. Even though there is a bend, it is lifting. That expression has given rise to the name Pinch Mayurasan. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, how peacock feather, any feather, not just peacock feather, any long feather you see, there is a lift in it. But a peacock feather is not unique, but more different than like a bird's feathers in that it has that top part and that's it's bigger. substantially longer yeah also. so then it, there is a little more bend and sway in it so you're saying that when you're balancing in the pose there's a little bit of sway is that a little bit of sway but more than the sway even though a little bit of sway is automatic to most people within the sway there is an energetic lift mm -hmm. it's not just a sway so forearm balance it demands more sh more shoulder strength, more to stay. I find I find handstand I can stay longer. Forearm balance easier to get up but harder to stay up. Um, so is that again to prepare the upper body strength upper for body for strength. shirshasana? And really, the strength has got to translate to the cervical, not cervical, the, the whole uh, spinal column lifting <clears throat> or lengthening. So generally, if you were taking a class uh, of intermediate folks, you would first make sure their handstand was solid, and then you would teach them forearm, and then introduce headstand? Is that That would be a theoretical idea in my head. <laughs> okay. okay. Tell, us, tell us what else is in there in your head. 
No, but I would look at the people that are doing the course. Yeah. And then find various ways of encouraging them to do better. Is there anything that comes to mind why you would choose to go from handstand to headstand uh, as opposed to handstand forearm and then headstand? Like, is there something that... Nothing specific that comes to my mind right now. But again, I would say I would look at the people doing the pose. And what are you looking at? Energetic movement. So the whole person or their whole, eyes? or Whole body, whole not body. the person. And how much energy you see that they can stay lifted in an inversion? Is that accurate? Yeah. But if I look at the whole person, if that's the thought going on in my head, the teaching changes considerably. Mm -hmm. Because the emphasis does not become physical action. Emphasis become like, you know, why on earth are you doing this? What for? You are not doing it for strength. Strength is there simply to provide a basis for something else. Otherwise, it's very, uh, otherwise, and I say this often also in the class that without that emphasis, it is gymnastics. Not that there's anything wrong with gymnastics, but it's not yoga. So if I'm looking at the whole person, I'm thinking something different. Okay? But it's like this. If I look at a beginner who doesn't have strength to do anything, then I don't look at the whole person because the foundation is not there. Right. Okay? My, automatically, my eye goes towards their physical abilities, their breathing their you know facial expressions so you teach at that level it's very much like you know you don't take a kindergarten class and let, try to teach them nuclear physics well i just want to take a little side side street here is you know in the united states you know most of us teachers are making a living by teaching classes that have multiple people in them and in any, any given class, you may have people that are more beginner and more advanced. And so the advanced people are saying, hey, uh, you know, like I want to get into my headstand and half the class you're like isn't ready for headstand. What do you do as a teacher? Do you do? You... I, I first pray. <laughs> okay. <coughs> That's always a good thing to start yeah. with. <laughs> God, you gave me this challenge. Please help me to deal with it because obviously by myself as this egoistic person i really don't have the ability to conduct this class so what happens in a class like this generally in a workshop that can happen okay, somewhere along the line without making any effort i ramanan sort of drops out and something else takes over at the end of the class i surprise myself like wow where did that how, come from where did that come from but if I try to figure out, like, you know, here are five beginners, here are five advanced students, and five intermediate, how I can't. I, I kind of know what you mean, um, because I definitely, and now I've been teaching over 20 years, and how many years have you been teaching, by the way? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> okay, but a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like, over, over 20 times two, I right? I started <laughs> teaching in 1968. Okay, someone will have someone do the math. Um, <laughs> when do you feel like, I, I could say for myself that I felt this shift in being able to see people, like you're saying, but not to the level you can. So when in your teaching trajectory do you feel like that started to happen? Like, I don't know. Okay. It's like asking when did you grow up from 12 years Yeah, to... but sometimes you look back and go, wow, I just started noticing that I... Don't need my notes anymore. Or Very well. I never read my notes. Yeah. I go to the class. I look at what's going on with people. Talk to them. In fact, I would say if nobody asked any question, I would have difficulty teaching the class because I'm not relating to what's going on with their life. Right. Fortunately for me, more often than not, somebody has some question. And what I found interesting, by the way, is that, you know, if I teach Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, on Tuesday, somebody asks a question. 
almost always, not always, but almost always, on Wednesday it would be the same question, Thursday it will be the same question. From a different person? From a different person. Yes. And so my feeling was that somehow the universe, the cosmos produces this. I completely agree. I've talked to many yoga teachers about this. It's like, have you been seeing a lot of lower back problems coming in on the same day? <laughs> like, it's, it is very strange. Um, okay, so back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, all right, so um, let's talk about headstand first. So Mr. Iyengar has a long, long, long list of benefits. I mean, they're like kind of over the top. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, he calls it number one, king of the asana. Um, it's the seat of Brahman. Okay, these are big claims. Um, people's thoughts will become clearer. People suffering from loss of sleep and memory have recovered with regular practice, coupled with Sarvangasana shoulder stand, helps constipation. So, I mean, there were a lot. I just took a couple of highlights. Um, what are your thoughts about all of those claims? I mean, that's... And coming from a grandmaster like him, I would say they are justified. However, <clears throat> look at therapeutic work in general. Okay. Generally, within therapeutic system of yoga, it is recognized that whichever posture helps a particular condition, if the same posture is done incorrectly, it will aggravate that condition. Now apply that to the king of the posture, Shishasana. If your neck is already hurting, yeah. then you do Shishasana incorrectly, it's going to ruin that neck completely. It's supposed to help it, but it won't. Okay. So, in a sense, because it's a difficult posture, although with practice most people can hold it for a longer period to allow for that change from physical to all the way to organic, sensory and so on. Okay. A similar king of the posture can be called Urdhva Dhanurasana, mm -hmm. but almost nobody can hold it that long. Right. So here is a posture which can be held longer, where you can get that progression. Okay. But if you are holding it longer by muscular effort, even when the posture physically is collapsing, that would be a dangerous thing to do and should not be done. The difficulty with that lies in that if I am in Mr. Anga's presence and he is kind of pushing me with his wonderful methods, I can hold it longer. But if with that memory I come home and say, I was able to do it there so I can do it here. Mr. Iyengar is not here. I have to pretend like he is here. Okay? Mm -hmm. And yet there must come a time when I don't need him. I should be able to do it myself. So there is an inner Iyengar that works. So I would agree that being a difficult posture and yet a posture that most people with practice can hold longer, you can penetrate from one level to the other. But if the king is angry, aren't you in trouble? <laughs> Depends on who you are. <laughs> um... And look at Donald Trump, he's angry. and. How many Republicans just simply quieten down? Yes, sir. So you're likening uh, a bad headstand to Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> In my view, and politically, that would be my opinion. <laughs> but those who like him, love certainly that. love yes. him. Yes, okay. Um, I would like to start with, um, you know, I, I did a little research with my questions, and, it, you know, in light on yoga, Mr. Iyengar says all of the weight, or most of the weight, I think all of the weight should be on the crown of the head. And then, wow, on the internet, there's all these articles, Mr. Iyengar shouldn't have said that. And that's led to people with having neck problems. And so let's start with the crown of the head. What is your take on that instruction? If you have closer to the ideal body, you should be on the crown of the head. All of the weight, or most of the weight. Yes. <clears throat> Nobody has that. Nobody has an ideal body like that. That comes around after years of practice. Yeah. Assuming you inherited a good body to start with. Someone like Mr. Iyengar who, although initially did not have a good physique, 
but through very dedicated practice developed it. Okay. How many people have that kind of dedicated practice? Not many. Not many. Yeah. So then my next question is, okay, if it's not supposed to be on the crown of the head because a lot of us don't have ideal bodies, um, what is your take on like, okay, the most common things I see is maybe a blanket under the head, but not under the elbows. That really helps keep the weight out of the head. You could set up the blocks where it's helping to lift your thoracic and that keeps the weight out of the head. Are, do you think those are just as beneficial or, or no? Those are, those are very serious mistakes. Oh, t- talk about that. If somebody's upper arm is short, yep. but the neck is long, they should not put the head on a blanket and the arms on the floor. Completely the opposite. It should be under the elbows and not under the head. Under the elbows, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I was saying it if that's the appropriate thing that they should be doing, but they're not taking the weight in the crown of their head like a classic optimal body. Is it as beneficial or is it slightly less beneficial? I would look at their breath okay. and their coloration of you know skin and so on. Same posture today may be beneficial to you because of whatever has happened in the last 24 hours. Tomorrow, for the same person, the same posture, I might say, don't hold it as long. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I decide that by my own experience in my body. Why am I able to hold the posture much better one day, and the next best, and, and you know, next day it seems to laugh at me? Should I not respond to how I am feeling? I do that with other things. The day I feel hungry, I eat a lot more. When I don't feel hungry, I don't. So you think this idea of saying, I'm going to do headstand five minutes every day is a bad approach? It's a good beginning, but to use it as a fanatical approach is bad. Mm-hmm. Okay. I should do the posture. You know, I wouldn't say that to a raw beginner, but as people get more experience, they should be able to decide by other sensations whether they should continue to hold the posture or repeat more often. Um, The real teaching would be to teach people how to judge that. Can you say something about that? Yeah, in a large class that's difficult to do. Because in a large class often I don't even know everybody. Large classes that have come about, especially now in the Western world, uh, is not the way it was taught in India. Original teaching was few students, one teacher, sometimes one teacher, one student, mm-hmm. and if there were more students, there were always other senior students helping. Uh, but economically, that, that cannot work here. Right. So then how do you empower the student to know? What are you trying to impart to them? Whether they should do a two minute headstand today or an eight minute headstand this day? In my teaching, I have really come to fall in love with the sensation of movement of the head diaphragm. Yeah. For those of uh, our people maybe listening that don't know what that is, can you briefly ex- describe it? When I'm out of breath and I'm struggling with the breath, like after running, I look at what is the feeling in the head is the head seems to expand with inhalation. If I, even after running, if I consciously attempt to do the opposite in my head, on inhalation release the brain in, on exhalation let the brain have a sense of releasing. Brain doesn't move very much, but the sensation is big. Mm -hmm. I recover from that fast run very quickly. And you use that as your metric to see whether you yes, should... Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Now, I know most people don't teach that way. Okay? But in my teaching, I have found that very useful. Um, even having someone that's very dedicated to the practice, loves Ramanan, but is a very old person. I'm person I'm thinking of is Maria Mata. She comes out of Trikonasana, where she cannot usually hold more than a minute, and says, wow, I don't feel tired. Because you were cueing her around the brain diaphragm. That's a great story. 
And at the same time, I have a friend, student, who now lives in Hawaii, uh, used to live in Santa Fe. Uh, because of her own learning and teaching, really objected that, no, I don't feel this in my head. I feel on inhalation, the brain expands on exhalation. So I said, look, I am teaching you what I feel and what I find to be correct. If in your body, for whatever reason, something different happens, go by your feeling. When you are taking your last breath in your life, you don't want to say, I wish I had done this the way I wanted to do it. <laughs> that is a very stupid way to die. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, okay, so um, with the, I'm also thinking another popular variation of headstand is the one between the chairs or hanging in the ropes if people have ropes. Um, can you again just tell us, do you feel like that is almost as beneficial as doing a headstand? Um, I think some of the benefits that are coming from inversion, yeah. the way the heart works, are even better in a pelvic sling hanging than in Shishasana. Okay. okay? Overall, nothing touches Shishasana. What do you mean? Nothing is as beneficial. Can you say what the benefits of Shishasana are, please? <laughs> I mean, just a few. <laughs> I know, I know, we volumes, but... <laughs> See, when you ask a question like that, my mind goes into, why on earth am I doing Shishasana to start with? <laughs> but you just made a big statement, so... Yeah, the I'm big like... <laughs> statement is, it helps me towards enlightenment, towards knowing who I am. Not only because of the immediate physical struggle that is involved, but when it begins to be more accessible, I'm able to hold it longer. The, the brain is in a very different state, does different things. Even after I come out of the head balance, okay, there remains a sense that I'm still in Shishasana. Okay? Happens with every posture really, but with head balance it seems to happen more often for me. Same with Sarvangasana. That doesn't have, if I'm in Trikonasana for half hour, when I come out, I do feel a little lopsided, but I don't quite feel I'm in Trikonasana. Whereas in Shishasana, if I'm able to hold it longer, which incidentally, I was never able to hold it that long. Sarvangasana, I can hold half hour or longer. But in Sarvangasana, for example, even after I'm out of the posture, that inner joy of being in the posture is still there. Okay, well, you t well, you're upside down, so there's a lot of physiological things happening, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. No. So, would you say more about that? There is an energetic sensation that yeah. happens. There is a sensation of calmness that happens. There is a sensation of the whole outer world kind of becoming irrelevant, disappearing. That sensation that happens, mm -hmm. which is leading towards a sense of meditation okay? where the brain is not running here, there and everywhere. All my external needs or wants disappear. And that pose more than any other pose? In that pose more than any other pose. For reasons that we already talked about. Yeah. Interesting. I wish I could hold uh, Shishasana for as long. I never could. But you were just about to say a little more about the sling, why you get more benefit. Well, why is that? Because you can hold it longer? Because I can hold it longer. Mm -hmm. Much longer than I can hold Shishasana. I had a bad shoulder injury as a child that has never allowed me to hold the headstand that long. But is there something... Okay, so with the pelvic sling, you've also got... It's, pull, it's holding your iliums in. So there's... There's something extra there. Yes, so, I mean Badakarnasan basically. <clears throat> yeah, so what can you say is energetically different about that? The openness of the pelvis or? Openness of the pelvis allows my breath, effect of the breath to be felt much deeper in the pelvic floor, which I could feel in Sarvangasana, but I never could feel it in Shishasana. Or until, almost never. Until I mean. you went into the pelvic sling. Interesting. What if you were doing Shirshasana and then brought your feet into Bhattakanasana in the middle of the room, let's say? It would be better. But not as good as a Not sling. as good as in a hanging position. Interesting. 
And to, to, to extend that further, I'm in a sling, but instead of keeping my legs in Badakonasana, if I stretch my legs up, that's an interesting feeling. That teaches me something about what I should do in Shishasana on the floor. Right. Or there's the version, and if you have ropes, you can put the legs straight with a, with a plank with across a your plank. thighs, which is quite nice because it helps to ground your femurs, yeah. right? And if I recall correctly, very, very often, even though Mr. Ayanga would insist for the students to be straight, he was often in a posture that I would call is close to Vipritkarni. Not Can always. Describe that. The, the, the pelvis would tilt back and he's straightening the leg from that. There's a clear more lordosis. Uh -huh. okay. But I, I didn't talk to him about that particular thing. But if in a similar conversation, let's say I was to ask him, like, why do you do this? His response might be, you are not ready for it. If you can do it, it would be nice, but you are not ready for mm. it. I am learning from moment to moment. A and he maintained that position to the very end when I saw him. That you people think you know yoga. I am still learning. Right. I have seen um, photographs where he's taking more weight also on the forward part of his head. Can you talk about that? Yeah, why, why if, if I feel compromised in my cervical spine, where I feel I have the strength, but, uh, but the, the, the cervical extension yeah. is lacking, then I would do that. Mm -hmm. In fact, for my neck, I often used to do that, come much more on the forehead. Okay, well, if Mr. Iyengar went on and on in his light on yoga uh, about Shirshasana, he really went on about Sarvangasana. There's way more uh, talked about in there about the benefits, um, m many more benefits. Um, let me just start with, do you agree with that, that there are more benefits? I personally agree benefits. with it, simply because it, it sort of, you know, pumps my ego up that I, <laughs> I can hold this longer than most people can. Okay, can you put your ego aside and answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> because I can hold it longer, <clears throat> the chance of the posture going from physical to physiological okay, to organic and so on yeah. is much bigger. Right. And do you think that's why he said that? Because most people can hold shoulder stand longer? I would assume so. Yeah. I would, I would assume so. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. And then he uh, calls that pose the mother of yes. asana. Um, where does he, do you know where he get these, gets these references of calling Shirshasana king and Sarvangasana queen? I, I have to tell you a <clears throat> little separate story. Okay. Because what's happening is that he's thinking in Indian terms, using Indian cultural things, putting it into English, and then people who don't have that background at all are interpreting it literally. Yeah. I'm thinking of a wonderful poem I heard when I was a little kid, which most English people know. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the sky so high, like a diamond in the sky. Now imagine somebody who has no background of where this comes from learns English language and says, you know, these English people were funny. They thought star was little. <laughs> they thought star was above the sky. And they thought the star was twinkling. If that is literally translated into another culture, <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> it's absurd. You can't do that. All right. Fair enough. Mother, I withdraw the question. <laughs> mother in Indian culture is, I, for want of a better word, is like the king of the house. Within the four walls of the house, even the father doesn't have that kind of authority. Outside, dad is a king. Inside, mother is a king. And by that... Uh, when, when, when the mother becomes a grandmother, she's totally in charge of everything. Not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically, everywhere. Okay, so tie that to Sarvangasana. 
Sarangasana gives a sense of better understanding, better control over all different levels of asana practice to the point of putting the brain in a meditative state, which is kind of a final state. So it feels like it's answering all my questions with regard to what I want from this asana practice, which the king doesn't do. King is demanding. Well, I definitely feel like headstand is more stimulating to me. And when I do a longer shoulder stand, I feel what you're talking about, kind of that calming, quieting down. And is it just because I can hold shoulder stand longer? Or is I the think energetics so. I of the I think pose? primarily it's because you can hold it longer. There are other physical differences, but the yeah. main reason is because you can hold it longer. Interesting. Think of this. Mother is at home. She's preparing a meal. You are out in the field working where father is asking you to do more and more and more work. Okay? While it is, it is being done lovingly, but there is a pressure of do, 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 do. You go home, mother says, sit down, be quiet and have, you know, enjoy this meal. That's the difference. Shishasana is demanding, mm-hmm. is rajasic in many ways. Sarvangasana is not. It's pretty demanding. <laughs> <laughs> for some people. Okay. <laughs> it's my nemesis. <laughs> okay. But for the same person, I'm thinking obviously of Ramana. Okay. For Ramana, headstand is not only more challenging physically, but more demanding. And no matter how well I do with it, it is always like, that's not good enough. I did my best, but that's not good enough. Sarvangasana gives me a completely different feeling. Because I can hold it longer, I can do it more effectively than almost anybody can. Okay. I could hold shoulder stand as long as Mr. Angar can. Mm-hmm. And if you pushed it to three hours, I can hold it for three hours. But at the end, it doesn't give me a feeling like I'm depleted. So is that what you're talking about, the reason that in most um, uh, lineages of Hatha Yoga, uh, Hatha Yoga, uh, Hat Yoga, Hatha Yoga, not uh, Yoga, I mean. <laughs> it's Hat Yoga, Hat Yoga, there is no Yoga or Hatha, that last A, you should cancel it. All right. I'll see if our sponsors will let us cancel the A. <laughs> um, is that why um, headstand is usually taught first or, or, or practiced first? Because of what you're saying? In some traditions it is not. I know. I'm <laughs> saying in most traditions you do headstand before shoulder stand. Can you... But I think the two, can, two traditions cannot be directly compared in the sense that in the tradition where they do the headstand afterwards, they don't hold it very long at all. Right. Whereas in Angar's case, it, it, it is held much longer. Yeah. And so can you say why you want to do that? Why do you want to do headstand before shoulder stand? Headstand, to put it simply, can increase blood pressure, can increase the sense of um, uh, rajasic attitude can increase anger even. Sarangasan calms it down. So if you are going to have an approach where there is a lot of dynamic work, you do want to finish with something that is calming. Mm -hmm. Not depleting, but calming. Sarangasan does that. Can you comment on the name Sarvangasana All Limb Pose? Again, I would go to twinkle, twinkle, little stars. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like you to clarify that. First of all, it's not all limbs. Okay. Limbs in English means arms and legs. Right. Okay. The name is Anga. Anga means parts of the body. And even then, it's not a reference just to the physical part. It's much deeper. Sarva Anga Asan means it fulfills all different dimensions. To translate that into all limbs posture, it's kind of twinkle, twinkle, little. So. so all parts is more accurate? And it Not means... even just physical parts. Right. All aspects of you. 
as a person, as a human being. And so that's what, one of the reasons you were saying that you get so much more out of it because yeah. of that? And headstand. Now, he might be able to get it in Shishasana also. I was going to say, head, yeah. so you can't get that in headstand? That's Very few people can. Mm -hmm. Very few people can. Because of strength. Because of strength. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay, because I asked you this about Shishasana, um, which older stands, Arvangasana, if you, well, let's start with the blankets because that, of course, is like a huge controversial thing about how many blankets, should I use blankets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, could, you, could you tell us something about that? And then I'll ask about variations. You're of talking about blankets under the blankets shoulders. Blankets on the shoulders, yes. It's a prop. Yes. For literally hundreds of years, Sarangasan was done in India where nobody used a blanket like that, where the shoulders were elevated and the right. head was lower. Right. Okay. But these people were ready for Sarvangasana. Now Sarvangasana is done by raw beginners who are not ready for it. But because of other benefits, it is said, okay, let's give you some support so you can do it. In England, they have thick mats. In Pune now, those thick mats are taken. You can't roll them. They're, they put three mats or more, put everybody in line and put them in. This has become kind of standard at Iyengar Institute. Yeah. So I, I directly asked Mr. Iyengar that for, I told him you know, for thousands of years, Sarvangasana was done without any support. His response was, you people come here and complain of neck problems. I'm tired of dealing with it. So, use a height. Then it became sacrosanct that everybody should use a height. And it becomes part of the teacher training. When he never meant that, he never himself did it. And if advanced or seasoned students were doing it without any support under the shoulder, he never objected to it. So, can you say why um, he was doing it besides neck problems? What, what does the taking the blankets or the mats under your shoulders? I think I know, but I want to hear your take on it. If you take support under the shoulder, it allows you to push the head of the humerus down and get the seven cervical off the floor. Now, what I have seen, I think a particular person, where they used to use two blankets. Then the neck bothered them, so they had one more blanket. And some three, four years later when I saw them, they were doing Shirshasana on a pile this time. Sarvangasana. Sarvangasana. Yeah. Rather. So I looked at it and I said, you know, the prop was supposed to help you to lift the seven cervical off the floor. Now you are resting on it in such a way that it goes more into the floor. This was never the intention of Sarvangasana. Even when my father, who first taught me all this, uh, some of these postures, even at that time, long before I met Mr. Iyengar, I was told not to drop the seven cervical on the floor like that. Can you talk about why that's important that that happens and what happens when people, I see a lot of people who um, just don't want to use props because they feel like it's a sign of weakness and their seven cervicals on the ground and they don't want to they don't want to listen to reason. So can you say why it's important that it lift and what happens when it doesn't lift? I think they're looking for another incarnation <laughs> where they will correct it. <clears throat> and physiologically, the way the neck is, you do not want to reverse the cervical curve. If the seven cervical vertebra drops like that on the floor, you are going to reverse that curve. Some people, by using a height, are able to lift the chin away and sort of attempt to recreate that curve. But the root of the curve is in the occipital area and in the seven cervical. One of the two roots is collapsing down. Okay? Think of sitting on a, on a large bench. This side, the legs are holding you. The other side, the bench collapses. Would you sit on that bench to have a, an ice cream? 
So what can happen to somebody who is prop averse and they don't care that their seventh cervical is dropping? What would, what's the long-term effect of that? That person to me in today's terminology is saying that I am averse to vaccination. So no matter what happens, I will not take vaccination. That's your choice. You live in America. If you ask me like scientifically, logically, is it better for you? Yeah. But if you have an aversion to it, then psychologically it's not good for you. And so they may end up with neck pain, but... They may end up with... And you might find somebody who is so sort of strong that even though they do it without this prop, they never hurt their neck. But that to me is like... I find children straying, playing, let's say, soccer in the middle of the street. And I go and tell them that, you know, this is dangerous. And the child tells me, I do it every day, nothing happens. Would you therefore consider it correct? No. It is dangerous still. Right. The fact that nobody gets hurt, you are fortunate. Right. So just because somebody by doing wrong, anatomically incorrect sarvangasana doesn't get hurt, that's fortunate. It's not correct. But if they insist on doing it their way, I wouldn't object. Because ultimately, what do you want from yoga? You want freedom. Why take that freedom away? But I had somebody in India I saw, that Mr. Angar even knew, was smoking. Not in the class, but just before coming to the class, or immediately after going out of the class, they would smoke. And uh, Mr. Angar one day told this woman in the class that, don't you think I know you are smoking? But you are smoking and hurting the body. This is compensating for that. It's not good for you to smoke. But if you are not going to stop doing yoga and not going to stop smoking, what am I to tell you? Go ahead. Yes, we all have our own path, right? We all have our own path. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the variations that folks can do in shoulder stance. So, if you're not able to do it in the middle of the room, uh, often you're told to do it near a wall, so you can do it with bent legs on the wall, or even better than that is the back edge of the heels on the wall with straight legs, and then there's chair shoulder stand. Do you feel those um, variations are just as beneficial? For that person, yeah. For the person who can't do the one in the middle of the room. They're doing what they can. So, so you want to go to the one that's the most challenging. I mean, here's a question. So let's say I can do shoulder stand in the middle of the room for three minutes, um, but then it starts to collapse and I don't have... But if, I, if I'm at the wall, I can stay for 10 minutes. Is, should I do it one one way and one the other way? Or it's... Yeah, if, if I would alternate one day this way, one day that way. <clears throat> Then slowly, in the beginning, you might only do, uh, you know, one day in the middle of the room, uh, but other six days against the wall. Then slowly, instead of only one day a week, you make it twice a week. Right. You gradually increase it. So you're trying to get your strong version that you can hold for 10 minutes, you're trying to take that into the least supported version that you can do. Um, and I don't think there's a lin linear progression there. It's back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about chair shoulder stand because that is unique um, in the shoulder stand variations that it's kind of shoulder stand and it's kind of Viparita Karni. Um, can you comment on that particular variation of it? That's a very popular one done in the Iyengar system. Do you, now. Now, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can tell us if you are if you were around for the evolution of that. Um. See, <clears throat> let's take somebody who is not going to do the classical standard way, but they will only do it with a chair. Then there are people who will only do it with a chair, 
but actually go to Viparitakarni kind of action. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they don't want to do it. We live in a free country and free society. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so is your answer the same? If it's the only variation you can do, mm -hmm. it's better than not doing it at all. Yeah, can do is different. If it's the only variation you will do, I would say, what are you looking for? You're looking for comfort. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is comfortable in most cases, muscularly, is weakening. If you need a support, you use a support. But to make it completely comfortable so your muscle is not even active or less active is not desirable in my view. But take somebody who loves Sarvangasana on a chair in a Vipritkarni position. Otherwise, he's never going to touch that posture. For that person, I would say, yeah, fine. Who am I to determine? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how far this person... The, the intent is to strengthen the body and the muscle. But if they choose not to strengthen... I know Ramanand Patel who used to slump in the chair completely as a child. And every so often father would say, sit up straight. Yeah. So while he's watching, I sit up straight. The moment is not locking, I collapse again. <laughs> and my mind as a child would say, this is easier, so why not? The fact that this is damaging to the body was totally theoretical. Although I, I heard it, I knew it, but it was like, no, no, it doesn't damage my back. I can still play soccer. Right. But that was the wrong conclusion. Okay. Uh, I was surprised um, when I was preparing for this interview that um, I just, as in my mind, I thought, of course, Viparita Karni would be in light on yoga, and it's not. Um, why do you think it's not in there? I think you have to ask Mr. Hanga that. No question. idea. <clears throat> is it is it something that he taught? Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, but I saw it done more in what he called um, therapeutic classes, which mm -hmm. was used to be initially once a week. Then I think it was twice a week. But you had to go in the evening to help in that class. Okay. To some specific people, he would say, do Viprit Karni, not everybody. Okay. Then he started doing Viprit Karni with... See, Mr. Angar constantly invented in light of whatever he saw. Okay. Viprit Karni, they started doing with the legs against a column, where the thighs were tied to the column. Right. And if you have ever done it, you will find that that is even more wonderful. Every way in which Vipritkarni, Vipritkarni is wonderful, that wonderfulness is enhanced by being tied to the column. Right. Everybody but, doesn't have a column at home. Oh, <laughs> right, which is a problem. So then I went to the Hatha Yoga Pradipika where they go on and on and on about the benefits of Vipritkarni and also the more classic pose. There's no props, right? You you're kind of dropped over your hands in a shoulder stand, more upper body position, but your pelvis is dropped back and your legs are up. Like you were kind of describing, Mr. Angar was doing a little bit in Shoshasana, right? Um, so um, can you say, oh, oh, and it also says in the commentary in that book that it will uh, eliminate death if you hold it for something like three hours, which I, I know is being poetic language. Twinkle, twinkle, yes. little star. <laughs> Can how, you... many, how many yogis do you know from ancient India that are still alive? I don't know any. So none of them did Viprit Khan? Well, maybe they're living in the caves. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to be known. <laughs> Tell her, only the tigers are in the cave today. <laughs> They ate, they ate the yogis? <laughs> yeah. No, they are the yogis. Okay. Oh, the tigers are. Okay. So can you say a little bit about what, um, how that pose is different from shoulder stand, for example, energetically? It almost seems like an earlier version of shoulder stand. Mm. No? No. Shoulder stand has several therapeutic effects, particularly with regard to pelvic abdominal area, and even more so for women than for men, although for men also it could be good. 
all of those effects, if you are to achieve therape therapeutically for someone, are better or easier because they can hold the posture with, you know, it's all supported posture. Right. Are better in, in uh, Vipreet Karni. The only thing that Vipreet Karni comparatively lacks is legs are more active in Sarvangasana. They are less active in uh, Vipreet Karni. But then the genius of Mr. Angar said, okay, I will make the legs more active in Vipreet Karni by tying them. That tying is not done just to hold the legs together. When the legs are tied together, they muscle the bones act better. But as I said, being a genius, he says, ah, interesting. In Viprit Karni it works better. Why don't I tie the legs in Sarvangasana? He was a person who always pushed towards a better direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he learned both from his ability of this, you know, being gifted a genius, but also he would have to admit that he learned from the mistakes of his students. When the student made a mistake, the student didn't know how to correct it. Mr. Anger found a way of correcting it. Mm -hmm. I had somebody come here one time to learn something of yoga from, and he said, I, I don't see why Mr. Angar doesn't give credit to his teacher. I said, look at light on yoga. On the first page, the credit is given. So this idea that he doesn't give credit to his teacher is wrong. You heard it from somewhere. But why does he, why? Nobody used props before now. Why? I said, okay, do it without the prop and let me see. Yeah. Then I showed him how he was collapsing. He said, yes, prop helps. Um, Traditionally, it was never used. I said, every tradition changes and should change in light of more information. Otherwise, you should be living in a cave. And he left. <laughs> and you don't know what happened, whether he got props or what. <laughs> he writes to me maybe once a year now, asking for guidance on what to do. Well, that, that means he's maybe practicing. That's good. Um... Okay, so in the Iyengar method, um, women who are menstruating are told not to invert. Um, again, for people who may not be familiar with the method, can you talk about why that is? Because the energy, not only just the blood, but with it the energy that should flow out, that flow is reversed. There is no scientific investigation done of this that I know of. However, we know specific examples of people who refused to listen to that advice and got hurt. Yeah. Now, if you want to take a chance with it, you know, I heard just what last week, this 16 year old kid is going to fly around the world to break the record. I would congratulate him, but he's taking a risk. So you're saying uh, people with uteruses could on their menstrual cycle go upside down, but they're taking a risk. Yes. And the risk is, you could say they hurt themselves, but can you be more specific? I think they would, they would find that energy depleting. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, medical science doesn't have an answer for them because they don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. All they would say is, you know, why do you do it? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and I would love for you to say a little bit more about prana apana with inversions. Can you talk about um, like why they're such an important part of a yoga practice prana-wise, pranically? See, there are five major pranas and five minor pranas. <clears throat> I don't want to go into details. I don't this. want you to. <laughs> That's another talk. <laughs> but the two aspects of that pranic energy moving in the body over which I have somewhat of uh, control, ability to manipulate, are the pranavayu and the apanavayu. Hatha Yoga and Ayurveda defines apanavayu as what we call abdominal breath and even more the pelvic breath. The way Bhagavad Gita 
where Krishna talks of prana, pana, sama, yukta, pachaminam, chaturvedam. Balancing in breath and out breath. I balance five digits kinds of. Yeah. The, the exhalation is called apana. So we have to be careful with terminology. Same word is used to mean something different. Mm. So don't go to Bhagavad Gita and say, Bhagavad Gita says, you know, exhalation is upon. Bhagavad Gita can say then, for Bhagavad Gita it is correct, because he meant exhalation. Okay. Here, the meaning of apana is different. Where we talk of apana is the movement that happens as a result of inhalation. Inhalation does something to prana. That something done to the prana in the lower body is different. That different is called apana. Okay. What else do you want me to say? Well, I want you to say what when you practice inversions a little bit more seriously, meaning you can hold them for a little bit longer. What is the effect on those two? Like, why is that? Why is that helpful? For a variety of reasons. Generally, what we call physical health, apart from breath and circulation and so on, it depends on what goes on in your pelvic abdominal area. Even more specifically, what happens to your digestive system. Still more specifically, what happens to the eliminative system. Food should be properly chewed and digested. But even after that, whatever waste is left, if it is not properly eliminated, it will cause ill health to the body. This is Ayurveda. Yoga goes further with her and says, okay, how through postures we can help that particular part. So, upon Vayu, as it relates to the eliminative system, is given much more importance. Not that the other parts are not important, but this is a primary thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go to India to a good Vaid, uh, uh, Ayurvedic doctor, yeah. one of the first, no matter what complaint you go with, the first question you'd ask is, how is your eliminative system? How is your bowel movement? Because they solidly believe, and I think correctly, if that goes wrong, many other things will go wrong in the body. Okay. So it's very important. So in, in uh, inversions particularly, the way the sensation of that upon vibe is, you can learn to direct it particularly to help the system. It requires some teaching. People can't automatically do it. So, but generally, yeah. if you find that somebody has you know minor constipation and they do inversion, they want to then go to the bathroom and eliminate. Okay, so uh, this may sound like a dumb question, but. We just talked about menstruation. You shouldn't go upside down because the natural flow is down and we don't want to reverse that. Well, the natural flow of elimination is down, but we're turning ourselves upside down. You're saying that would be better for elimination and constipation. Can you explain that? So uh, are you saying that somebody who is menstruating but is constipated, what they should do? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm saying uh, the downward, we don't want to interrupt the downward flow of energy when someone's on their period. No, no, let no? me continue that yeah. trend of thought. Okay. Let's say literally somebody came and you told them they are constipated and I, you want to tell them that inversion is good for you. But they say, no, I have my period. What would you tell them? I would say, let's talk to Ramanand. <laughs> <laughs> no. Even for people who are menstruating, the teaching given is that don't do inversions every time you are menstruating. Right. Occasionally, for some reason, if you need to do it, that is acceptable. Even to learn if you want to do inversion, briefly is acceptable. Don't make a habit of it. It's a long-term repetitive inversion done by somebody who is menstruating each time that there is an energetic problem with it. There is no physical problem with it. You know, your blood is not going to go reverse right. itself. I understand. But there is an energetic problem with it, which the, the ill effect registers after long improper practice. So in my body, I feel uh, when I was menstruating, like the apana would be very dominant. Like I felt, I could feel the shift. 
Um, so you're saying if you're constipated, for example, then your prana is not flowing. So let's turn you upside down. Yes. Is that is that the reasoning? Quite. Yeah. Okay. So it's trying to. But if somebody all the time is constipated and all the time is menstruating. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I know. Pray. Right. Um, what about the opposite problem? What about someone who has diarrhea a lot, like irritable bowel syndrome? Would the inversion They can help also with that? do inversion, but with more support. And what would be the difference energetically between someone who's constipated, where the apana is not flowing, and someone who's got diarrhea? Hearts. First of all, the diarrhea should not be because of some. You know, uh, improper right. food. And right, so not parasite or anything like that. <clears throat> or parasite. Yeah. That has to be. The, right. The yoga won't correct. But let's say it's somebody that has constant irritable bowel syndrome and that's their expression of it. Then I would say they have a weakness, right? Yeah. Weakness in, in the organs and musculature. Okay. That person should try and strengthen that area. When you try to create a strength, the diarrhea may increase. So you have to be very careful how mm -hmm. that strength is created. Not all the time, every day. Do when you say their strength, in the, are you talking directly of inversions or something else? Any other posture. But are you saying inversions would help that person as much as the constipated yes. person? Yes. So, it, so in other words, you're saying inversions are a regulator. If you're on one side of the spectrum or the other, it's going to try to bring you back to... Yeah. Experience has shown that the inversions will be done differently. Like for somebody who has diarrhea, inversions would be more of a supported kind. Even let's say they do sarvangasana, it's not full sarvangasana. You would give them the wall or the chair? Give them a wall or even more support. So as not And to... also it is generally not done with straight legs. If you make the legs very active, it will cause diarrhea. Hmm. So which version would you give them? Chair? Oh, oh, chair you, you, with uh, legs with, folded. I see. Bent knees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even the legs are tied more. Okay. Um, so also we know that going upside down is not so good for people with high blood pressure, generally. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Yes and no. As a general rule? As a general rule, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because this is being recorded, I'm reluctant to say this, but I will say it. You take somebody like um, glaucoma or detached retina even more, yeah. should not do inversion ever under any circumstances. Right. Mr. Ayanga will put them in a pelvic sling. But this is Mr. Ayanga doing right. it and he's constantly watching what's going on. Right. Yeah? He waits for certain signals and says, that's long enough today, come out. So by giving a posture that can be damaging, he is pushing the envelope, but he knows when to get the person out. And this person's detached retina is cured. That doesn't mean an average teacher yeah. should be taking an average student who has detached retina and putting them upside down. Right. Okay. What is generally true and medically proven to be true, that uh, uh, putting the head down like that is dangerous when you already have this eye problem, that should be respected. When you come to someone like Mr. Ayangar who knows what he's doing and changes it, then you go by the fact that you are in the hands of a real expert here. Right. Okay. But so, I don't want that to, you know, for the medical science people who are listening to this to say, we will also experiment. They don't do that. Because they don't know yoga. They don't know what to watch for. Right. Watching blood pressure and so on is not enough. Uh, well, where I was going is, so people who are menstruating, people generally with high blood pressure, without a grandmaster, someone with a detached retina, is there any other reason why you would advise a student not to do inversions? If they're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. That probably is a bigger reason than anything else. Mm -hmm. If they're afraid, I'm not dealing with inversion, I'm dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I'll find different ways of dealing with fear. An example, perhaps not an excellent example, but I'll, somebody is afraid of going in a pelvic sling. Okay. Okay. So I support them. I put my foot on a chair, 
They're lying down basically on my leg. Little by little, I lower them. Once they give a, you know, they take a couple of breaths, which indicates to me that, okay, this person is relaxing. I start swinging them. <laughs> that seems like you're pushing it a little bit. I am now. pushing a little bit. But that gets, gets rid of the fear. Now the person is, ah, you know, able to do it on their own. Right. What are you afraid of? The, the maximum fear for that person does not come up when they're trying to go into the posture. It's when they drop back. That's when the fear climaxes. So I swing them to say, look, it's fun. Right. And I have definitely had people who would put their hands out and say, okay. I'm, I'm, I want out. I want out. So you bring them out. Okay. But you hold on to them and ask them to hold on to the rope. Okay. Relax the brain, head diaphragm. Okay. Okay. Once you see them breathing properly, you bring them out. And even that person, I never had a case like this, but suppose somebody says, you know, that was fine one time, but I never want to do that again without you being here. I would say, fine, you should not. Right. Uh, well, for years, I, students would regularly ask me, like, if, what, what if you only have 30 minutes for your practice? What do you do? And I'm like, pray. No, I say down dog. No, I'm telling you what I would say is uh, down dog, handstand, headstand, shoulder stand, shavasana, um, if I only had a half an hour. And, and the, but I was reflecting on that, given we were going to talk about this today, and I, I don't really know why. I would do that. I mean, I don't have a, I think because I've heard it's the best thing to do, but not because I, I have a felt sense, oh, that's what I should do. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't recommend that I would for, say, for a seasoned student who has an inversion practice. They only okay. have limited Let's time. Let's assume the person is young, yeah. just very busy. Yep. Okay. I would say, you know what, tomorrow do downward dog one minute each time, do it three times. Slowly increase that. When you are able to do downward dog, practically for the 30 minutes you have, apart from relaxing wow. at the end, yeah. then start doing sun salutes. Surya Namaskar. Learn to do Surya Namaskar. Don't tomorrow do 108, but learn to get to that level. You are a young person, you are just very busy. 208 sun salutes. Don't do it every day. You'll be in trouble if you do. Okay? Learn to do it once a week. Slowly increase it twice a week. And then see how far you can push it. You will find your whole energetic level. Instead of being tired, you are going to find you have a lot more energy to do what you want to do. Okay? If I ask you to do 108 sun salutes on the first day, you are going to find yourself depleted. You will feel tired. Okay. Then I'll give him my example that, you know, I have done it in a way where I would get up in the middle of the night almost, three o'clock in the morning, and do 108 sun salutes, go back to bed. I wake up with a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you have to have uh, a long time practice um, and and what do I want to say? That you keep that faith. You know, for example, you kept us in shoulder stand yesterday for a very long time. And it was challenging, but I, I could do it. And I knew. It was very long for you. It, it was very long for me. From what I was seeing right. and I'm thinking of yeah. myself. Yeah. It was very short. Okay. So, so but next, I, next but week I, it will be longer. But I knew that <laughs> I would feel better afterwards. And I did. Yes. I mean, I felt fantastic, right? Yeah. So and it's... What I'm, what I'm getting at is it, it's harder. You, you couldn't start a beginner and just tell them that. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> You'll feel so much better after. Because they just don't have that level. See, just... Usually, whatever I do on Wednesday, I try and make it a little more subtle on Thursday, but it's basically the same thing. Yeah. Okay? But yesterday, Thursday group happened to be people that I felt are... Uh, more adept. I, there was almost no complete beginner that could be hurt by that sort of thing. And if they can, the permission was come down, don't hold it. Right. Okay. But I could push that group. I could not push the same group. I did not feel comfortable pushing that group on Wednesday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, you know, it's like a painting. It evolves. To say, why did you do this brush and put it in this stroke is not a good question. Right. Uh, well, I want to end with um, a quote by Mr. Iyengar. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, and maybe, maybe it's just legend, and maybe he didn't really say it, but um, you can't be depressed with open armpits. <laughs> you can't be depressed with open armpits, and that was his um, kind of uh, encouragement to get you to do handstand. Or maybe Urdhva Dhanurasana. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, it makes a little sense to me. I like it. <laughs> But I have not heard Mr. Iyengar say that. <clears throat> so it may be urban legend. Could be. But maybe we'll check into that to see. If I have known true. a teacher who is saying something and to impress upon the students that this is to be like I'm saying, this person says it's so in Bhagavad Gita. So I waited. I was in the, in the room. I waited for the person to finish the class. When that person came after the class, I said, where in Bhagavad Gita I say so? And this person says to me, that wasn't for you, Ramanan. Which means they're using a superior authority to impress something upon the student. Unfortunately, what they were impressing was wrong also. But I didn't get that. So perhaps the person who said this about the armpits was doing the same thing? Possibly. But maybe Mr. Anger said it. If it's helpful, <laughs> see, if it helps, what's wrong with a lie? Okay, shall we leave it there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so hey, maybe... The, the, yeah. the, the story that comes to mind is, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting in a room, which has several doors. Somebody comes running and says, help me, help me. Uh, somebody's after me to kill me. I said, okay, go through that door, run away. They run away. And the person who is angry comes with a knife behind and says, did you see this person? I say, yeah, yeah, I sort of did. Which door did they run through? Would I put in point at the correct door? No. Absolutely not. Somebody says, but Ramanand, what about you wanting to be honest? I said, look, if I really want to be honest, I would say, mister, I know I saw the person, I know which door they went through, but I'm not going to tell you. Then I get the knife. Exactly. It's a stupid thing to do. <laughs> You're so allowed. nonviolence, nonviolence uh, is more important than truth. Yes, e every time. I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time today. Thank you.